Today is Palm Sunday, and we remember from reading scripture, we've heard it preached before and read it ourselves, of when Jesus came into Jerusalem, coming down from the Mount of Olives on that, on that donkey and coming into town, and how people were, were shouting Hosanna uh, to the, to the uh, king, we call, uh, as they called upon him and, and recognized that uh, at that particular moment that uh, he uh, was the one from the Old Testament that had been talked about. But all of those cheers turned to jeers by the end of the week. And we see the way of the Delavarosa, of the way of suffering for our Lord Jesus Christ. So this morning as we think about Palm Sunday, we think about Passion Week, we're reminded how important it is to give reflection, especially to the resurrection. Now our pastor will, this coming Friday night, he's going to be talking about the cross. You'll hear more about that in an announcement. But he'd be preaching about the cross, and there'll be music, there'll be scripture that will deal with that. But we also know that uh, on Easter Sunday, a week from today, there will be a strong message about the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, how important that is. And the resurrection is important to us, because the Bible tells us that Jesus was the first fruits, and that we're going to uh, one day be raised just like he was raised. 1 Thessalonians 4 speaks about that. And tells the truth of the fact that we will be raised in the, in the same way that, that he was raised. And, and how important that will be for us. I'm reminded of the fact as, as uh, this event that is in our future and as we look and as we um, will be uh, so blessed by the fact that Jesus will meet us in the air, will be raised up. I'm reminded of the fact that Arlinda and I just a couple of years ago, we bought... Um, our plots here at Fravel Memorial Gardens and uh, we bought our cemetery plots and so those plots are near some friends uh, of ours that have been here in the church and uh, as we bought the plots went out and looked it over I noticed we're right next to a tree and so I have told our friends that when uh, Jesus raptures us us be sure you uh, look back and make sure we didn't get caught in the limbs of that tree <laughs> But we don't want to be left behind, all right? And uh, so I, I think of that and that blessed day that is going to come. But the resurrection is more than what we are going to celebrate next Sunday. Yes, the resurrection as we celebrate Easter is about when Jesus overcame death. He overcame sin. The devil was defeated, that is for sure. But there's more to it than just that. Christ is risen, that that is a fact. That we have evidence of the fact that Jesus was raised. But there's also another fact in the scripture we're going to study about today. And that is that you and I have already been raised as well, spiritually. That we have been raised. That is a fact of the scripture. And I am so thankful to our Lord Jesus Christ for what he did. How that he willingly went to the cross. And that he gave his life for us. But in the process of doing that... We now have a shared life. Every believer, every one of us have a shared life in what Jesus did. We too died with him that day 2,000 years ago and were buried and we find ourselves co-resurrected with him as well. And so today we're going to be reminded of the fact of this truth and that we have our identification in Jesus Christ. But our passage of scripture is also going to tell us how we are supposed to live since we are resurrected people. Our pastor has been preaching through the book of Colossians. So turn in your Bibles to Colossians 3. That's the next passage. And in Colossians chapter 3 verses 1 through 4. We're going to see the resurrection power and the difference it makes in our life. In Philippians chapter 3 verse 10. Paul said that I might know him and the power of his resurrection. That I might know him, yes, and the power of of his resurrection there is power in the resurrection of Jesus Christ and it makes a difference in how we are to live our lives John Phillips is a wonderful Bible commentator and, and wonderful scholar and he wrote a commentary on the book of Colossians and at this particular point he speaks of that resurrection power he uses the illustration from John 11 and John 12 about Lazarus and about Mary and about Martha and how the resurrection power made a difference in their lives. You remember in chapter 11, John chapter 11, Jesus delayed coming. He wanted to use this as a teaching point. 
So he didn't want to come and just, uh, just heal Lazarus. Uh, he wanted him to die so that uh, he could show his resurrection power. And we see the different responses. We see Lazarus raised. We see Martha coming out to Jesus uh, right before uh, he gets to Bethany, some two miles from Jerusalem. And then eventually Mary comes out. And, of course, Jesus speaks his wonderful words that he is the resurrection and the life. And then by, we, by the time we get to chapter 12, we see the difference is made in their lives. In, in verse 2, we see the difference in Martha's life. Remember earlier in the book of John that Mar Martha had been critical of Mary. She, he had been, she had been complaining that Mary didn't come and help her with all the kitchen duties that she was at the feet of Jesus. And Jesus responds to her that, that Mary was doing the best thing at that particular moment. But now you find in verse 2 of John 12, Martha is serving. There is no critical spirit, no complaining at all. Why? What's the difference? She now understood resurrection truth. And she was experiencing the power of the resurrection. And the same for Mary. Mary was struck with grief in chapter 11. But now she's taking some ointment of spikard and she is anointing the feet of Jesus. Her grief is gone. And now she is experiencing the resurrection power in her own life as she's worshiping the Savior. And what about Lazarus? We go on down that chapter in verses 9, 10, and 11. And we read that Lazarus has become a witness. Yes, people came to see Jesus. But they also came to see Lazarus. They came to see Lazarus not because he was a good man, not because he was a friend of Jesus, even loved by Jesus. They came because he had been risen from the dead. Now, yes, he would experience it again, but he was experiencing at this moment resurrection power. And so we too, having been raised with God uh, through, through Jesus Christ, we too can experience that power. Now, in Colossians, the book of Colossians, chapter 1 and 2, deals with what Christianity is not. Our pastor did a wonderful job last Sunday morning, a wonderful message to us uh, about, uh, in chapter 2, those closing verses of chapter 2, uh, about the problems that the church of Colossae was having with false philosophies and aestheticism and, and following rules and, and ceremony, all those kind of things that uh, were, were false and, and caused, causing people to, to fall away, to fall prey uh, to false teaching. And so we find that, that Paul gave a, a, an explanation through those two chapters of what we believe, that the doctrine, the theology. But here, verses 1, 2, 3, 4 of chapter 3, it's the bridge. It's the bridge now to the practical part, how we're to behave, how we are to, to live. And it's a beautiful passage of helping us to understand the difference, in this case, these four verses as the bridge, that we are resurrected people and there is to be a difference in our life. So let's look at our first point. As resurrected people, we do need to understand our, our past, our past gift that God has given to us. And that is that we have been raised, that we were dead in our trespasses and sin, we were dead, but now we've been raised to a, to a new life. And this is a gift. Notice in verse 1, if then you have been raised with Christ. That word if probably would be better translated since then you have been raised with Christ. That word raised actually means to be co-resurrected. We have been resurrected along with Jesus Christ himself. Spiritually, We've entered into the death and the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. In Galatians 2.20, I've been crucified with Christ. And yet I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. In Romans chapter 6, 3 through 5, or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just like as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we may live a new life. For if we have been united with him in death, like this we shall certainly also be united with him in the resurrection like his. See, we have this union with Christ, the moment of salvation. 
The moment we become a believer in Christ and we died to that old way and we are dying with Christ as he died 2,000 years ago, buried in a tomb, but we also were resurrected in 2,000 years ago. Your baptism, and I pray and hope that your baptism, that you remember it clearly, that maybe those thoughts come to your mind right now of when you were baptized. You may not have understood it to that moment, but that baptism symbolized what Christ did for you and me. He died on a cross, he was buried in a tomb, and he rose again the third day. It also symbolized and identified you with Christ Jesus himself because he was baptized you're being baptized you're following his example you're obeying his command but there's something else and the scripture is pointing us out is the fact that we died along with him 2,000 years ago buried in that tomb raised on the third day now you might be thinking pastor I didn't understand that or I didn't know that well I was baptized became a follower of Christ and in February of 1959 in Homestead, Florida, and my pastor, Brother Luther, Luther Key, uh, was, the, was the instrument that uh, God used for me to come to faith in Christ. And then in early March, I was baptized. We had a, had a wonderful revival. A number of us were baptized on a Sunday night. I'll never forget a nine-year-old boy remembering. But did I understand this truth? No, I didn't understand this truth. I did understand I was a sinner and I needed the grace of God. I could not save myself. Jesus came to be my Savior. And I sought forgiveness of my sin, invited Christ to be my Savior and Lord, to follow him, to give all the heart that I had at that moment that I knew, knew and understand, understood. But as time went on, yes, I knew I was being obedient to baptism, but as time went on, I came to understand this precious truth of what Jesus Christ had done in my life. And what I see is, is this is a gift, as Paul is mentioning, that we have, have died with him, that we've been raised with Christ now. This is a gift that came from Jesus himself. Someone may ask you, as they do me from time to time, who are you? And I'll tell them, I'm, I'm Travis Coleman. I'm married to our Linda, nearly 55 years. That we have three children, that we have wonderful three uh, uh, in-law children, children that are part of our, our lives because of our, uh, they're married to our children. And I tell them we have seven grandchildren, one of those being a granddaughter-in-law into our, into our family. And I, I share that with them, that, that's who, who I am. Well, what do you do? Well, I, I've been a Baptist preacher. I was full-time Baptist pastor for, for 45 years. Well, that, that may be how you answer, you, you give these details about, about who you are. But spiritually, who am I? Spiritually, I'm a child of God. Spiritually, I was redeemed by the precious blood of Christ. Spiritually, I find that I am in Christ Jesus and he is living his life through me. This is my identification with, with Christ. And I can share all of these, these things spiritually. But what the, but the Apostle Paul does next not only does he tell us about our past, but he tells us uh, that we need to understand our present goal as resurrected people because now he's going to tell us how we are to live. If we have been raised with Christ, then how are you to behave? How are you to live your life? And so as we begin in the second part of verse 1 and through verse 3, we're going to find three goals that Paul lays out very clearly what we need to do. And the first goal that he lays out to us is found there in the last part of verse 1. Seek the things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. This is a goal. Now we understand goals. Right now we're in the middle of March Madness. There, there were 64 teams on Thursday and Friday. Then there's 32 teams. At least Tennessee is moving on. Hopefully the SEC would be represented. Auburn and Florida didn't do such a hot job or Kentucky staying in that race but we have three teams and all the teams when they started out all 64 of those teams didn't they not all start out with the same goal to make as many baskets as possible to have as many points as possible more than the team that they were playing so they could advance to the field of 32 then to the sweet 16 the elite eight the final four and then on april 8th to be in the championship game, two teams left, and one would be crowned the champion. That was the goal, to outscore the other team. 
to put as many baskets they could balls into that into the basket there into the goal and to win the ball game in the same way goals are important to us goals are guides that will help us to strive to to achieve a desired end and that's what Paul is saying here Paul is going to give us these three goals and said this is this is the desired end you want you want to live the life and recognize there's a new life and you want to live that to the honor and glory of God. So he begins in, in that last part of verse 1. He says, seek. And that word seek is an imperative. It is a, it is a present imperative verb tense in the Greek, which means keep on seeking. It is a command. Keep on seeking. Make this your life goal, seeking after the things of God. Become preoccupied. Let this be the pattern of your, your life. Remember Matthew 6, 33. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. The same word, the same Greek word, seek. In Matthew 13, Jesus gives a whole list of parables. And one of them has to do with this man who is, who is hunting for a pearl. He's, he's looking for a precious pearl, and he finds one of great value. And what does he do? He goes and sells everything he has and gives himself to purchasing that pearl, all the finances that he could muster up to buy that pearl. In the same way, we're seeking the pearl of our Lord Jesus Christ. And as we look, and he goes on to say, seeking the things that are above, we're looking toward heaven. Heaven is our guide. And we're going to see in a moment, Jesus is seated there. And the reason that we focus on heaven, on its values, and Jesus, because we're to seek after Jesus' purposes for our life, his plans for our life, his, his provisions for our life, his power for our lives. He says, seek the things that are above. We are to be living in a whole different realm, and this is a heavenly realm that God has given to us. And we're to center our life on this, on this. The things that are above that, that we're looking at is from heaven's point of view, the character of God. We're looking after the things that we might call the fruit of the Spirit that is found in Galatians 5. These are the things that are to guide us, the, the love, the peace, the joy, the gentleness, and on and on, the fruit of the Spirit. And all the other values that we find in heaven. And it says here, where Christ is. Many of you are, are familiar with a compass. You've used a compass maybe when you've been out uh, on a hike in the woods and you know that the needle is always going to point to true north. Where Christ is our true north spiritually. That's where he is. That's why we focus our attention on the things that are above just like the compass needle spiritually as well. And notice that Jesus is seated at the right hand of God. Spiritually, Jesus is here right now with us. Where two or three or more are gathered, Jesus is in the midst of us. He told us that. But he is here spiritually because of the presence of the Holy Spirit that is in each of our lives. At the moment of salvation, the Holy Spirit was given to all of us. And so spiritually speaking, Jesus is right here with us right now. But literally, he's at the right hand of the throne of God. David talked about it in Psalm 110. Peter talked about it all the way through the book of Acts. Paul talked about it in his letters. Even Stephen, who was dying as he was being stoned to death in Acts chapter 7, looked up and saw Jesus, but Jesus this time was standing next to God, watching what was going on, getting ready to welcome Stephen into the kingdom of God. But Jesus is seated literally right now at the right hand of the throne of God. So let me ask you a question. Where are you? right now where are you right now well literally we're right here in Prattville Alabama when Paul wrote this letter to the church of Colossae he was writing to people that were in Colossae in Asia Minor so literally we're just like they were right now we're here in Prattville but in Ephesians chapter 2 verse 6 it says God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realm in Christ Jesus. Spiritually, not only have we been raised, we're sitting at the right hand of the throne of God right now next to our Lord Jesus Christ. We are seated there as well. 
And here's a reminder that we're living in two worlds that are superimposed upon each other. Our feet are here on earth, but our minds, our thoughts, all are supposed to be directed toward heaven. So that leads me to the second goal, and Paul wants to really make sure that we get the point. He's going to use a different Greek word, but notice in verse 2, set your minds on things that are above. Not only seek the things that are above, now he says, set your minds. And the idea behind set there is to think. Let this be your disposition. Not only do the things of, that, is, uh, that God asks us to do in our Christian life, but be sure that you're thinking about these things as well. What do you think about? Philippians 4, 18, 8 says, Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, Whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about those things. We're to be thinking about those things. Have you ever heard the phrase, get your mind out of the gutter? You've heard it, you've said it. Get your mind out of the gutter. We're talking to somebody, maybe they were cursing, somebody told a, a, a dirty joke. They're thinking evil, wicked thoughts. Get your mind out of the gutter. This is the opposite. Set your minds on things above. Let this be the focus of your attention. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, often use these verses in funerals. Therefore, we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away. These bodies are, are wasting away. Yet inwardly, we're being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs all these troubles we experience. Now notice the last verse, verse 18. So we fix our eyes, focus, not on what is seen, that's earthly, but on what is unseen, that's heavenly. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. And so the second goal of setting your mind on things above reminds us of this focus, our priorities. So let me ask you some questions. What do you think about most of the time? What do you talk about most of the time? What do you invest your time and your talents and your treasure money most of the time? Whatever it is that you are thinking about, talking about, are investing, time, talents, and your treasure, that's your priorities. That's your real priorities. And yet here we're reminded, no, set your mind on things above. And then let it permeate through what you think, through your conversation, through what you are investing yourself in in this world. And where do we get this? We read a fle- a Philippians 4, 8 about what we're supposed to be thinking about. But where else? From God's word. Why does our pastor constantly emphasize the word of God? Why is it that every gospel preacher emphasizes the word of God, the scripture, because this is the only reliable source for our thinking. When it comes to the authority within the church, it is always the word of God. And then we look at historically how the church has expressed that in teaching and in doctrine. And then your experience comes way down here. Because I hear people say, well, God told me. God told me. Well, it has to measure up to what God's word has to say first whether God told you anything or not. It's got to measure up. It, it, does it, is it consistent with what we read in the word of God? Romans 12, 2 says, Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. How are you transformed? How is that mind renewed? It's through the scripture. It's spending time in the word of God. Letting the word of God dominate your minds and your hearts and your life. It will bring about godly behavior. That's what it will produce. What we heard preached last week, part of the problem was that that these people were falling prey because they weren't spending enough time with Jesus. They weren't spending enough time in the word of God. 
Therefore, they were falling prey <clears throat> to the false teaching of that particular day. A few weeks ago, many of us from First Baptist attended the River Region Pregnancy Center Banquet. It's a fundraiser. They do it every year. First Baptist was instrumental. It was the lead church because of people in this church that had a heart for a pregnancy center kind of ministry back in 1990. And while we have included lots of other churches and expanded the ministry through a, through a broad uh, board, we're thankful for Carla Wyman and many who are volunteers and who serve faithfully in that ministry. At that banquet, there was a man by the name of, of Kevin, and I think it was Levin, was his last name. But Kevin came under the influence a number of years ago when he was a student minister of a man who gave a dramatic reading, a dramatic reading of the book of Luke. And he had an appointment with that man the very next day, and the man shared with him about how to saturate yourself in the word of God and take one book at a time and read it and really master the book and then move on to another. And Kevin became so convicted by this and felt that it was uh, he had developed a passion for this, that he, he first memorized the book of, of Philippians. He came to understand it, gave himself to it, memorized it. He actually quoted the book of Philippians in dramatic fashion to us the night of the banquet. It was wonderful. And then to the book of John and on and on. The point is not that we have to find ourselves memorizing a whole book of the Bible. The point is saturating ourselves with the word of God and letting those principles live through our life. Now let's move on quickly to the verse 3 because not only is there the goal of, of seeking and setting, but there is also seeing. Seeing two truths that are in this passage in verse 3. For you have died. We say, Pastor, you've been talking about that. Well, I'm going to talk about it just a little bit more. Because it's important to understand that you have died and that we're in this new union with our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, for we have died. It's Again, it's a past tense heiress, which means it is a completed action. This happened the moment that you were saved. It's irrevocable. You can't change it. And in 2 Corinthians 5.17, it says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation, and the old has gone, the new has come. We are to be new people because we have died through that old way of life. And we've been raised to walk in a new life with Christ. A pastor in California shared about two sisters who had come to, uh, to understand the gospel and the good news of Christ. They had given their life to partying and, and drugs and alcohol. And, <clears throat> but they were saved out of that and became very sincere Christians. They received an invitation to come to a cocaine party. There was an RSVP, so they wrote back, we're very sorry that we cannot attend your party. We recently died. <laughs> they died to an old way of life. They were raised to walk in a new life with Jesus Christ. And so they, uh, this was the only way that they could respond is, hey, we've died to that. And we're raised to a, a much higher realm now, a heavenly realm, like Jesus himself. When Jesus was raised from the grave, he was in a different realm. When you have been raised, since you've been raised, you're going to be living in a different realm as well. And not only that, notice that passage in verse 3. Your life is hidden with Christ in God. What's that all about? In ancient days, it was believed that when you were buried, that you were now hidden in the earth. Uh, can you think of anything worse than the thought of the rest of eternity left in a hole someplace? You're, you're hidden in the earth. You and I, we are hidden with Christ in God. That speaks of our position with Jesus Christ. We're hidden with him. It speaks of our security with him, that we're now protected with him it speaks of our eternal security no longer do we have to worry about sin self or satan because we're now hidden in christ in john chapter 10 verse 28 jesus says as a believer follower you're now in his hand and no one can snatch you out of his hand but he said my father is greater than me 
and no one can snatch you out of his hand. We are doubly protected. We are hidden with Christ. Precious things are hidden, aren't they, in, in, the, in the earth? Diamonds, gold, emeralds. You and I, we are hidden in Jesus Christ. We need to see these truths. Now lastly, as resurrected people, not only understanding our past gift, the benefit, and not only recognizing our present goal, let's also recognize our future glory. Notice in verse 4, when Christ who is your life, let's stop right there. One more time, Paul is hitting it. We are in a shared life with Jesus Christ. We're in a shared life. And it says there, when Christ who is your life. It's speaking about that shared life that we enjoy right now. And we are to be fully devoted to him. He deserves all of our devotion. He deserves all of our, our loyalty. He is more than just our Savior and Lord. He is my life. He is your life. He is our life. And here we are on heaven, and he is our life. It's a little bit of heaven on earth. That's what this church is to be. This body of believers, the bride of Christ, you're to be a little bit of, of heaven here on earth. In Philippians chapter 3, verse 20, we're now citizens in heaven. But we are a colony of heaven on earth. Just like in the Roman Empire, they would designate certain cities, and Tarsus was one of those with Paul. It was designated as a, as a Roman city. You're to take on the Roman culture, the Greek language. You were you're to live as Romans, to be a testimony of the Roman Empire. In the same way, that's what we are here on earth. We are a testimony of heaven, and we're to live like heavenly people. But not only do we share in his life now, we're going to share in his glory. It says, when Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. That's the second coming of Jesus Christ. We're going to share in his lordship. And, and this is the ultimate goal of history. Everything is moving toward this event that you and I call the second coming of Christ. There's more prophecy about the second coming than there was the first coming. And what a glorious event that will be. Jesus came as our Savior. He came to redeem us the first time. He came to show his grace. The second time, he will come as our sovereign to reign. And he's going to show us his glory. And he's going to allow you and me, as we now no longer are hidden in Christ and God, we're now going to be revealed. We're going to be made known. Now let's draw this to a close. Let's draw this to a conclusion. This passage of Scripture, four verses packed with wonderful truths we have died and we have been raised to walk in a new life this new life it's powerful it's real but so is the presence of sin in our world but sin is no longer our master but it can overpower us but God has given us everything we need with his power and his grace to overcome second Peter 1 3 his divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life. And it comes through our knowledge, meaning scripture, of him, Jesus, who called us by his own glory and goodness. But I tell you what I fear. I fear there are some of us living in spiritual poverty. We have some church members today. They're headed to, they, they came to Sunday school and then they, they took off. They said they would listen to the service online, all right? But they, they took off to Cape Canaveral. They're going to, on a cruise. What if th that family, they, they booked passage on that cruise ship, but they didn't realize that part of the passage included all the buffet meals and all the food. So they packed in their suitcase snacks, food for their five-day trip. Never going uh, where the buffets were being served, they took advantage of other things on the cruise ship, but they always went to their stateroom and ate the snacks they had in their suitcase. I fear some of us have punched our tickets to heaven, but we fail to understand or see or be blessed by the wonderful truths that are in God's word of enjoying 
to travel with our Lord Jesus Christ and focusing on him. Yes, we're to live in this world. We're to raise our children. We're to make a living. But don't live like this world is all there is. This world is temporary. Stop trying to be successful in the world's eyes and enjoy all its pleasures and fail to see that this world is just a dash compared to the time in eternity. I want to challenge us. Stop talking, stop walking, stop acting like the world. We don't have the same goals as the world. And we need to understand true spirituality is recognizing our position in Jesus Christ and live in that position. Prince and princesses and monarchies, from the time they're children, they learn how to be the king and queens, the future king and queens. And we are to live, though spiritually we're seated there in the heavenlies as well, here we are preparing ourselves by living as kings and queens in this world. That's true spirituality. So let's spend our time more consecrated toward Jesus Christ. Our attention, our focus toward him. He's invited us to share in his life. And let's live truly resurrected lives. Where we work, where we go to school, where we play. All of these different places. Why? Because there are spiritually dead people all around us who need to hear the gospel. Who need to die to their old way of life, and for them to walk in newness of life. During the second century, Ptolemy said that the, the earth was the center of the universe. The sun, the moon, the stars spun around the earth. And that was what was believed for 1,300 years until Copernicus came along and helped people to understand the sun is the center. And the earth and all the other planets revolve around the sun. There are many Christians that live and act like they're the center of the universe. The sun, S-O-N, is the center of the universe. And we're to live our lives. He is seated at the right-hand throne of God. And until we join him... Let's make sure he is our life. He's my life, your life, our life. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for this time, this precious time of just sharing Scripture and helping us to understand what your Word has to say. I pray, Father, that through your Holy Spirit, you illuminate our hearts and minds right now to fully understand this truth and apply it. Father, help us to understand our past uh, is found in this wonderful gift of being raised, that we died to an old way of life we've been raised. Help us to understand the goal that's present with us, to seek and to set our minds and to see this valuable truth. And then, Father, we look forward to our future, the future glory you're going to allow us to share in. Father, if there's one here in the sound of my voice that doesn't know Jesus, this would be the day they recognize what is waiting for them if they would just surrender their life to Christ. They would seek forgiveness of their sin that's found at Calvary. And by coming to him, recognize they will die to an old way. And they will be raised to walk in a new life, what they were created for. May they seek that this very day. Thank you for your blessings and for your moving of your spirit in this hour. In Christ's name we pray.